Um, I've got to say, the most unpredictable movie ever for me is... It's Memento. <laughs> of course it is. Um, uh, mainly because I don't think Guy Ritchie's character knows what's going on half the time in that movie. I can kind of relate to them. Um, the personification of it is, of course, that scene where he's running and he goes, what's going on here? Uh, I'm chasing someone. And then he runs at them and they pull a gun on him and they shoot him and he goes, oh, no, they're chasing me. I I've watched the film five, ten times. I, you know, I get the uh, central theme of the film, but the, the, the way each scene blends into the next, obviously backwards, but forwards, but, but backwards again, I, I think it's, it's an absolute masterpiece, that film. I absolutely love it. Having said all that, if I watched it again now from the beginning, aside from the ending, I couldn't tell you what's going to go on in between because it's it's obviously it's such a unique way of shooting a movie or, or sh not shooting it, but showcasing a movie. I, I've, I've watched it. I've watched that weird Easter egg where you can watch it the right way, but the wrong way. I, I just, I'm baffled by it. I love it, but I'm always going, well, what's going on next? <laughs> I'm gonna go with The Parallax View from 1974, a film that I grappled with during my university dissertation because I did it on Watergate and, you know, the pop cultural ramifications of the 70s zeitgeist. And it's one of Alan Pakula's, probably the underrated um, entry in his thing that was called the Paranoia Trilogy, which had Clute, The Parallax View, and then All the President's Men. And the thing with The Parallax View is that it's all about assassinations. And it kind of came out in the wake of the, uh, the House Select Committee on Assassinations. After JFK's assassination, there was a big thing in America. It was like, it was a conspiracy, whether or not you think it's a conspiracy or what, whatever. Uh, but basically there was a lot of thought at the time that lent weight to the idea that there was a conspiracy that killed the president and that there was then a cover-up that kind of basically covered it up. And the Parallax View is all about a fictional assassination that happens to a presidential candidate at the top of the Seattle Space Needle. And then it falls to Warren Beatty, who plays Joe Frady, to basically uncover the truth. And the thing with this film is that everyone's in on this conspiracy. Like, you don't know what's going on. It's so ridiculous. You're going through it. And there's a specific bit in the film that just completely throws you. You think that he's uncovering it in a classic kind of, you know, 70s conspiratorial film where you think he's going through the motions, he's finding everything. And then basically what happens is he discovers the, the, ident the, the location of the Parallax Corporation. And then he sits down. He's trying to infiltrate it and become one of their assassins to find out and expose the conspiracy. So he goes down and sits down. And then for the next five minutes, I kid you not, uh, they made an actual montage, brainwash conditioning montage that then you, are, so it's like you're sat down where Warren Beatty sat and you're just going through and watching it and it ratchets up more and more and more with all this different subliminal messaging and like coded language. And by the time it ends, you're like, well, what happened? Did, did he get brainwashed? Did I get brainwashed? Am I now an assassinate, an assassin for the Parallax Corporation? I don't even know to this day, Adam Wilborn. I'm probably compromised, but the film itself is great. There are so many different twists and turns to it, and I would encourage you all to go watch it if you haven't already, because it's kind of between Clute and All the Presents when it's kind of overlooked, but it's really good. I can never really, I was watching it the first time and I was like, what the hell is going on? This is crazy. And then the ending is also a proper stinker as well. So I would definitely thoroughly recommend the Parallax to you because you don't know what's going to happen next. Hello. Hello there, me again. Just like to say, it's not Guy Ritchie, of course. It's Guy Pierce. Bye! It's actually a really recent one. It is um, Sorry to Bother You, which yes! came out um, at the end of last year and completely took me by surprise. I saw the trailers for this film and I thought I knew exactly what it was doing. It was going to be a kind of comment on, you know, call centers and rising up against, you know, the upper class and stuff like that. And it is about that, but in this kind of mad semi future sci-fi dreamscape hellscape thing. It's about this man called Cassius who works for this call center and in order to succeed he puts on a white voice and he has to, um, he rises up the ranks and he eventually he becomes a power caller. All the while in the background the company he works for is essentially selling, you know, human slaves. They're getting um, contracts in so they have a lifetime of labor in these kind of prison cells so they can work for the corporation until they're dead. So he's kind of contributing to this system and already that is kind of strange. It's presented in this really dreamlike state but then it hits you 
with a twist about two thirds of the way through. Cassius is in for a promotion. He goes to meet the upper boss, who is played by Army Hammer. And they're in this kind of like debauched party. There's a lot of drugs, there's a lot of nudity, and they sit, sit, sit down for um, a meeting. And he does a big line of what he thinks is cocaine, and he needs a wee. So Army Hammer says, it's just down the hall. You have to go right, and then you're, then you're there. Then you're at the bathroom. So he walks down the hall. He accidentally goes left. He finds himself in this kind of weird place. He hears someone crying out, help me. He pulls back a curtain, and this horse-human hybrid <laughs> with a big whopper falls out and onto the floor. And at this point, you're like, what? what is going on? What is this? Obviously, the character in the story has not seen anything like this before. He screams, he runs back, goes, Army Hammer, what the hell have I just seen? What is this horse-human hybrid thing in there? What is going on? And then Army Hammer explains his grand plan. He says, you know, we want you in because we've got a new generation of workhorses where we are evolving humans into these creatures so they can work more and we can get more out of them. Obviously, very, very bad. And at this point in the movie, anything can happen. If you've just encountered, you know, a horse, a giant human horse, what what else is next? And the movie just continually surprises you from there on out, and you don't you don't know what's going on. I don't even know. I mean, I did like it. Anna Wilborn, did you like it when that happened? Because I imagine it took you by surprise as well. Yeah, it's a pretty big twist. It's a pretty big twist, isn't it? I imagine a lot of people will get to that point and just kind of, you know, switch off. I was in the cinema, and a few old ladies down the bottom row did actually leave when this twist happened. <laughs> and I, I kind of, I kind of don't blame them because you don't see it coming, and then everything after after that is just ridiculous and completely mad but it's the best thing ever and i will definitely watch it so you could at this point talk about almost any darren aronofsky film because that is his sort of vibe are you gonna go talk about mother no not requiem for a dream either but those two films are very unpredictable especially mother which i don't think i ever predicted that i was going to watch <laughs> a, ba a baby having a tinkle and then being eaten. But no, that's not the one. Uh, the, the one that I'm going to talk about is in fact Black Swan, which I thought was just going to be like a normal-ish sort of thriller about uh, ambition and greed and deadly con and sexy consequences. Um, and then it turned out to be a hellish nightmare where Natalie Portman peels her cuticle back. Oh, in the, is, in the, the worst, worst bit. It's like the most viscerally affecting thing I've ever seen in cinema. And when I talk about it, I can feel my cuticles peeling. It's horrible. That is, I, I mean, I didn't predict that that was gonna happen in that film, but the whole, the whole thing is sort of like, it, it's like a fever dream, so you can't rely on the narrative, which is sort of the point. And it jumps through all of these bits where you can't tell what's reality and what's not. And what, Aronofsky does that really well, but he does it in a way where he's like, I'm gonna mess with the audience on purpose. And I think I think he's never done it better than in Black Swan. I also wanna give a shout out to uh, probably the most ludicrous film that came out last year, I think it was, which is also the worst titled. It was called The House with a Clock in Its Walls. I've talked about this film a couple of times and pe some people don't believe this exists. So it's about Jack Black, who is a wizard or a warlock. Oh, I don't really know the distinction, but he's one of them. And um, he's trying to find a clock hidden in his house in the walls. That's basically the entire plot. Wow. But it's, it's, it's a bit like an R.L. Stein book, like a Goosebumps film. Um, and there's a bit where Jack Black, I don't, I don't know if I should spoil it. Nobody's going to watch it no. based on what I'm saying, right? Spoil it. So is, yeah. Jack Black gets caught in a time vortex and his whole body apart from his head gets transformed into a baby's body. It is the single most brilliant thing I've ever seen in my life. And he also has a wee. I don't know what it is with babies and wee. Right, you keep telling me about this movie. Yes. You've told me about this ever since it came out. I remember when you went, went to see it. I literally went to a press screening of it. And I still don't believe that it exists. I've seen the cover. Yeah. I've seen the trailers for it. I don't believe that any of this stuff happens. And I think you're posting along on the fact that no one's going to actually watch it. And you're just spouting some absolute insanity and making yourself a That would be quite unpredictable, though, wouldn't it? 
Right, so the, uh, the most unpredictable film for me was one that I just didn't know what was going on the whole time and still don't now. I've seen it a few times since. It's called Primer. Um, and the, uh, the director just like makes a whole meal of making it as confusing as possible. It's about two guys that discover time travel in like a rudimentary way in uh, some experiment in their garage. Um, and it's basically like one guy um, goes and sits in a room for six hours, then comes back, gets into a box, waits in the box for six hours, and then is basically back in time for that period, so it goes into an ever spawning loop where he then has to get back into the box again. The window cleaner's in, it's really making me laugh. <laughs> yeah, <it's awesome. laughs> don't know. Um, <laughs> so he's going in this um, perfect loop of time travel all the time and they use it to try and get like uh, profits and money. Um, but uh, what happens is that more and more of these people keep being made. So there's Abe and there's Aaron. And if they don't go back into the box, then there's a double of them wandering around. Yeah. So there's um, multiples of their, like themselves going around. They're doing voiceovers and you can't tell who's speaking. Um, they like convolute the whole like time travel thing and the way that it's explained isn't really explained. It's just them like arguing about like physics and other science things. Um, with each other and like there's, there's so many graphs and like detailed breaking downs afterwards of the, ooh, the window cleaners <laughs> um, there's so many graphs and detailed breaking downs of uh, how it's supposed to work that have been like floated around afterwards but the truth is I don't know what's going on and it's so unpredictable because there's no way of knowing how it's all supposed to work unless you are like a theoretical scientist who has some sort of grasp on what this kind of technology is and these characters' motivations with it to begin with. So it's, it's a really weird journey. It's not a long film. It's worth watching just to see if you like it or not. Um, but yeah, it's just, it's insanely complicated, therefore unknowable as to whatever could happen next. I think the the end's a good end, it's a good end. Uh, I won't spoil it, but it's like, um, it just kind of ramps everything up to 100. That was the only bit of grass, so I was like, oh yeah, that's that's not good by the end of it. Um, but yeah, it's 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 worth a watch. He has another one, like Upstream Colour as well, um, and everything that, I think it's Shane Carruthers does, is really, really complicated for the reason that he likes to make complicated things. Like, they, it, it's, it's his kind of getting back at the Hollywood system and stuff. Um, but yeah, Primer, great. No idea what went on, what is going on, or what goes on as I watch it. I've got quite a few for this. Um, number one is Mad Max Fury Road, um, which I'm a huge fan of the fact that they made all the trailers out of the vast majority of the footage from the first sort of 20 minutes, half an hour of that film. So that by the time you actually sat down in the cinema, um, a lot of the stuff that you thought, you know, all those big car crashes and all the big chase sequences and whatever, it was like, oh, that's clearly gonna be the climax. No, that's the opening act. And I love being in a, in a cinema and not knowing what's, where things are gonna go. Um, so I, like, that, I found that so refreshing, so many films give away their biggest moments in the trailers um, and it's just it's, you just rarely get it you rarely get a movie that's so confident that it can uh, make a trailer out of that opening stuff and then take you on a massive ride afterwards so I absolutely love that and um, also absolutely adore Endgame and um, because Endgame is like this really weird uh, Avengers Endgame really weird sort of time heist time travel -y, you know quantum mechanics thing that obviously everyone's trying to figure out after the fact and they can't because um, it's a mess um, in the best way and uh, but as soon as they establish the ground rules for that where they're just gonna like nip back into all the old films and steal the infinity gems and, and stones and whatever. Um, I never knew where that was going to be, where that was going to go. And as soon as Thanos started figuring out what they were doing, and he comes back into the present day, I loved all that. Um, couldn't think of how it was going to wrap up, and I loved it. Um, and the newest example is just Joker. Uh, I'm not going to spoil Joker too specifically, um, but the the way that, that movie starts to go, when everything starts to come together, when Arthur Fleck eventually starts to uh, become Joker and fully shed um, his humanity kind of thing, and just become this kind of weird like agent of chaos, he still has uh, intent. He's not as freewheeling and sort of like playful as. Uh, Heath Ledger's Joker or, or Jack Nicholson's where like you know Le Ledger literally says like I'm a dog chasing cars and it's like he's kind of just having fun being as wacky as possible whereas um, because you spent so much time with uh, Joker as Fleck beforehand you kind of have this intent behind him like he clearly has like a sort of agenda that he's going for and you don't know what he's going to do when he gets on the talk show that he's finally been able to get onto um, and that scene when he finally goes on the TV show um, that was the bit where I was like oh man I'm like really freaked out and creeped out I thought he was genuinely quite scary and um, the things that happen after that genuinely quite sickening there's like a way that I think they could have ended that movie that would have been bold as hell but also like truly sickening and disgusting and they pull it back for the very final scene and um, love all that stuff but um, yeah it would be that the way that Joker goes um, even though it's obvious that he's gonna become Joker um, the stuff when he finally embraces that chaos with a certain sense of agency that in itself is horrifying and but also brilliant to watch <laughs>